Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Clinical and Translational Science Collaborative of Cleveland, we welcome you and thank you for joining us. Before we begin, we'd like to share a bit about the CTSC. The Clinical and Translational Science Collaborative, or CTSC of Cleveland, is a collaborative among Case Western Reserve University and its affiliated hospital systems, the Cleveland Clinic, Metro Health, University Hospitals, and the Lewis Stokes Veterans Administration Medical Center. We aspire to be a catalyst for high quality clinical and translational research, both locally and nationally, by changing the culture and environment of biomedical research, sharing resources and expertise, and streamlining the research process to move translational research from bench to bedside and to the community. Every Thursday in February, we're investing one hour to learn about a current Black history maker. Today, we celebrate and meet Dr. Randy Vince Jr. Dr. Randy Vince Jr. recently began a new position at University Hospitals and Case Western Reserve University as an assistant professor of urology and the director of minority men's health at the UH Cutler Center for Men. He was born and raised in Baltimore, Maryland, and as the oldest of four siblings, he developed a passion for athletics. Dr. Vince attended Towson University, where he was a varsity letterman in football. At Towson University, he double majored in MB3, that's molecular biology, biochemistry, and bioinformatics and chemistry. He later attended Louisiana State University Health Sciences Center in Shreveport, where he earned his MD, and subsequently completed a Virginia Commonwealth University Health Systems Residency. He developed a passion for urologic oncology after his grandmother's passing in medical school. While at the University of Michigan, he earned a master's degree in computational medicine and bioinformatics. He has a keen interest in using precision medicine to combat the concept of racial biology and evaluate the intersectionality of environmental exposures and gene expression on tumor biology. Dr. Vince actively participates in research and community outreach events to promote health equity and eliminate healthcare disparities. He has a personal philosophy that he applies to his career and life, leadership through service, and he is extremely excited to serve the people of Northeast Ohio and beyond. Dr. Vince, the floor is yours to share about your work, and then we'll kick off the Q&A portion of your celebration. Awesome. Thank you. Um, let's see. Let's do share screen. Okay. Can you see the slideshow? Perfect. All right. So it's a pleasure to be here with everyone um, this afternoon. Uh, I want to thank you. Uh, Mrs. Thomas Esquire, I want to make sure I give you your proper due um, for the invitation to speak. And I am um, extremely humbled. Um, and I want to say something really quick. When you do equity work, um, the last person you look to serve is yourself. And so I must confess, when making this presentation to talk about my journey in medicine and efforts to reduce um, some of the rate, reduce and address some of the racial disparities that we know exist within medicine, um, it was a little difficult to talk about myself. Um, but with that being said, I, I want to just go ahead and dive right in. So I have no professional disclosures that I need to make. Um, to start this presentation, I want to start by kind of journeying back to um, my childhood and giving you all an uh, opportunity to just learn a little bit about my background and how I've got to this point today. Um, Unfortunately, I put this pause there is because there were a lot of negative experiences that I had in my childhood and that has led me to this point today. Um, but these things are etched into the man that I am. And so the reason I put this pause is because me telling you about these negative experiences is in no way aimed to glorify those experiences. Um, and I am very cognizant of the oppressive systems that exist in this country and have been in place for centuries and people are really literally dying on a daily basis as a result of those systems. So now that I got that out the way, I want to just dive right in with the introduction. And so every time I do a presentation, I like to introduce myself. Um, one, because I'm a surgeon. And when I tell people I'm a surgeon, they want to know, oh, well, what are your credentials? Where'd you, you know, where'd you train? All this other stuff. Um, but hopefully by doing this introduction, you start to understand why many of the issues we discussed today are so proximal to the man that I am um, currently. And so, yes, I am Dr. Again, Dr. Randy Vince Jr. Um, I did medical school at LSU in Shreveport, Louisiana, urology residency in uh, Richmond, Virginia, Virginia Commonwealth University, 
a fellowship in urologic oncology at the University of Michigan. Additionally, what you heard some in the introduction, I have a master's in computational medicine and bioinformatics, served on a few committees with the American Society of Clinical Oncology, and these committees were aimed at increasing representation in medicine, as well as addressing social determinants of health. And I just hit the six month mark here at University Hospitals where I'm an assistant professor in urology, but also um, the inaugural director of minority men's health. But I often tell people every time I do a presentation in life before any of those things, I'm a black man from West Baltimore. So many of the things that we'll talk about in this presentation are things that I've not only researched, but things that I've lived through. And so that's just a brief introduction, but I wanna give you a little more information about my background. And so, as I just told you, I'm a Baltimore boy at heart. Baltimore, just like many other cities around this country has is similar struggles. So whether we're talking about Baltimore, Cleveland, Detroit, New Orleans, Shreveport, Memphis, Richmond, DC, Philadelphia, you name the city, the clothes that you see people wear might be a little bit different. The lingo might be a little bit different, but the struggles are the exact same. And so I'm the product of these two wonderful people. Um, on the left, you see this is a picture of me and my dad. On the right, you see a recent picture of my mother. Um, I know uh, most people will say, wow, you, she, yes, that is my mom. And that's a recent picture. She's beautiful, I know. Um, but I want to start by highlighting something. Um, when I was 12, I lost my dad. Um, very suddenly. And as many of you can imagine, this was a very traumatic event in my life. But even before that, there were several experiences that are kind of etched in my memory um, and in the being of, in the fiber of the being that I am today. So this is um, a very bad picture of me when I was uh, 10 years old attending Hilton Elementary School in Baltimore City. And I put this there because even before my dad's passing at the age of 12, I saw and experienced many things that would shape who I am today. And so, you know, growing up in the inner city and seeing these things, you know, you saw things like hand-to-hand -hand drug deals where you learn to spot that um, from a block away. I saw drug addicts injecting heroin. Um, many times they would blow the veins in their arms, wrists, and hands and convert to um, injecting in their genitalia, seeing people rob, be shot. And this includes my own uncle and my dad. Um, you know, if any of you have ever seen this, it's very unfortunate to fall out after a shooting, but the image of my dad's blood being sprayed off the sidewalk with a fire hose lasts with me to this day. And so many of these negative experiences shaped me um, to where I was a notoriously bad student. Uh, I was actually expelled um, from a middle school, one of the middle schools I attended because of my poor behavior and poor performance. But thankfully I was able to use sports as a, as, a, as a conduit, if you will. And so I achieved a lot uh, athletically, had multiple honors in high school um, that allowed me the ability to go to college. However, attending poor performance schools my entire life, I must admit that I was not prepared for the rigors of college when I first got there. But even before getting to college, I got a chance to see how social determinants of health and medical distrust um, are on display, how they manifest. And so this is a lot of this initial part of the conversation will just be me giving you some personal stories. So this is these are my paternal grandparents. You see my beautiful grandmother here, who my family affectionately called Mama. She passed away when I was in high school. And at that time, I didn't grasp it. But our family, we really didn't go to the doctor's office much unless something was extremely wrong. And so as my grandmother's health started to decline and she knew things were getting bad, um, I remember having a conversation with my aunt in which she told my aunt, I'd rather lay home in my bed and die than go to the hospital, let them experiment on me and kill me. And so you can start to see how these things build on each other and again, are etched into the man that I am today. And so moving on, I had an opportunity to attend college. Again, I told you the struggle there was initially um, for the academic rigor, but I adjusted and adapted. I didn't make the decision to go to medical school until after college actually, but even after I made that decision, 
I remember reaching out to the pre-med pre-dent committee chair. Her name was Dr. Joe Discordia. And I asked her for a letter of recommendation. <laughs> and I still remember this email exchange in which she told me, you're a good student, not a great student. In order to excel in medical school, you need to be a great student. And she just flat out refused to write me a letter of recommendation. So this made me question myself and doubt myself on whether or not I was smart enough to actually move forward. However, persevered, was able to get into medical school. Um, and overall, the experience was positive, but there were things that stuck out to me that still linger to this day. Well, first and foremost, I was one of four black students out of 120. And so whether we're talking about how racial disparities were discussed in lectures, the fact that I had racist memes sent to me from classmates who claimed that they were joking and were never disciplined for it and probably are still out practicing medicine to this day. Attendings discouraging me from applying to competitive specialties. I had one attending tell me, you're no smarter than anyone else. Don't be upset with being average. And so all of these things kind of manifested and now a part of why I, many of the things that I do for my work and my life are so important to me. And then I want to just kind of highlight one more thing about how racial disparities persist. So again, I told you I'm giving you personal stories. So this is my other grandmother, Dr. Ruby Prado. And we're on my mother's side of the family, we call her Nana. And I wanna just tell you a little bit about her story. So she grew up in a segregated Baltimore, Maryland and she dropped out of high school in the ninth grade. She moved to New York City, she was a housekeeper. And then she ultimately moved back to Baltimore and was a plant worker. And in her thirties, she realized the importance of education and ultimately wanted to go back to school. And so she achieved a high school diploma in her forties. I still remember some of my older cousins because we often live with our grandparents coming over to teach her algebra so that way she could get a high school diploma. Then she flipped that from a diploma to an associate's degree, a bachelor's, a master's, and a doctorate in divinity. And through all that courageous work, wouldn't you know that when I entered medical school, the one thing that my grandmother wanted to do was see me walk across that stage, but unfortunately that never happened because she was diagnosed with a kidney mass, a mass that could have been surgically removed. And in fact, that is the standard of care treatment, but she received suboptimal care under the guidance of, let's start this medication, it'll shrink everything, and then we could do the surgery, it makes everything a lot easier. But as you can imagine, the reason I'm telling her story is because that didn't happen. She started that medication, her disease progressed, and ultimately in the second year of medical school, I lost my grandmother. And so I just wanna kind of wrap up that portion of this presentation. So my hope is that by sharing my journey, many people in attendance will realize the adversity that many people face on a daily basis, whether it's talking about the traumatic loss of my father at the age of 12, the experiences of both my grandmothers, and their experience with the medical system, understanding that resiliency is key. Nothing is impossible. So you, you can absolutely continue to push forward even when those haters might tell you that you can't. And then I also hope that you can better understand how this young Baltimore kid that you see here with my nana has now turned into the man that's here with you today. And so that's enough about myself. I wanna just kind of jump into some of the work that I've been able to participate in to try to help drive towards equity or strive towards equity. But before I do that, in the introduction, we talked about my personal philosophy. And one thing is leadership through service. But the other one I think is surmised in this quote by Frederick Douglass in which he said, I prefer to be true to myself, even at the hazard of incurring ridicule from others, rather than to be false and to incur my own aberrance. And so everything that I've been through in life has shaped my passions and the goals that we're pushing towards for equity are noble. And so regardless of what others may feel, what political climate we may be in, I encourage everyone to seek to pursue equity and to push towards equity. And so speaking of equity, I want to just kind of lay out in three different categories, some of the work that I've had to opportunity and the fortune to participate in. And those categories are increasing representation in medicine, 
increasing health literacy and addressing medical distress, and then examining health outcomes and how we research racial disparities. And I'll just touch on each one of these briefly. So when we talk about representation in medicine, where are we now? So I look at this paper and I think they accurately surmise where we are as a um, medical field right now, in which, as you can see here, in order to reach equity in terms of the proportion of Black and Latinx physicians being equal to that proportion of the population within society, if we were to double the number of Black students entering medical school, it would take over 60 years to reach that equity. If we were to double the number of Latinx students entering medical school, it would take over 90 years. Then you couple that with information from the AAMC, and it shows that if you look at 2014 and compare it to 1978, so we're talking about uh, almost 40 year gap, the number of black applicants in 1978 was 1,410 compared to 1,337 in 2014. Furthermore, to that point, the number of black students entering medical school, black male students entering medical school in 2014 was 505, excuse me, 515 compared to 542 in 1978. So you actually see we're doing a poorer job now than we were back then. And so at every step in the pipeline, because I look at this as a pipeline, was we we're talking about before college, during college, in medical school, residency, we're losing very talented people along that pipeline. And so I wanna just kind of just lay out some of the work that we've done at each step of, that I've participated in at each step of the pipeline. So starting with Doctors of Tomorrow, which was a program that partnered with the inner city Detroit High School to, excuse me, to increase um, exposure for underrepresented and medicine minorities. So that way they can come in, they can see people who look like them who are physicians, because as the old saying goes that many people say, it's hard to become something that you never see. So while we're talking about starting in high school or moving to undergrad studies and providing support and mentorship to groups like the Black Undergraduate Medical Association, which you see here, and they made me um, take the elders pose, which is everyone stands around you while you sit in the chair. You start to see how at every step of the pipeline, these things need to be addressed. And then moving forward, this is a program that I participated in with the American Society of Clinical Oncology, where we provided support and mentorship to current medical students who are underrepresented in medicine. And then even beyond that, writing about it, showing why we have this massive failure and what the impact is on us as a healthcare system and as a society at large. And so I'll move on to the next topic, but as I do, I wanna just let you know that these things are interconnected. And the reason I say that is because we talked about increasing representation. And these two studies that I put here, they show that black patients are more likely to report a positive encounter and trust their provider when their provider is of a concordant race. So to state that differently, if I'm a black patient and I see a black physician, I'm more likely to have a positive encounter and I'm more likely to trust that provider. And that increased trust leads to increased compliance. And I'm not trying to say that if I'm a black patient and I have a white physician that they can't do a good job of caring for me, but this is what the data shows. And so when we talk about health literacy, addressing disparities through health literacy uh, is not anything that's new. Um, this was a book that was published by the National Institute of Medicine. And in it, they said, efforts to improve quality, reduce costs, and reduce disparities cannot succeed without simultaneous improvements in health literacy. And so I just want to journey through some of the things that I participated in to help increase health literacy. And I'm going to start with medical school. So this was a, um, uh, uh, excuse me, an article or a publication by a local news station in Louisiana. And you could tell this from a long time ago because I still had hair at that point. Um, but what we did was when I was in medical school, we partnered with the after school program that was aimed at serving elementary, middle school kids from underserved communities. And we started to develop these health fairs where we would go and we would just teach things like healthy eating, um, book dealing with bullying, dental hygiene, all of these things aimed at 
increasing health literacy of these kids so that way as they grow up they can start to advocate for themselves and they can be empowered to take control of their health additionally had the opportunity to partner with the Cancer Society aimed at increasing education around prostate cancer, as well as engaging with Black fraternities like my own, I'm a Sigma, um, where we discuss not only prostate cancer, but other issues around men's health. And so finally, I want to just touch on health outcomes and research. And when I talk about health outcomes, I'm really talking about the disparities that we know exist within healthcare. And to be honest with you, it starts at birth. And so many people on this call will come to no surprise that when you look at this data and you look at infant mortality, you see that black babies are more than twice as likely to die than white infants. And it only continues. Answer in COVID. And what we know is that these disparities are rampant across all three. And if I want, if we had more time, we could break down all 10, really. And so when we see, when we talk about these disparities being rampant, we see disparities within cancer survival. This one is colon cancer. But we could just as easily substitute this for prostate cancer, lung cancer, you name it. There's disparities within cardiovascular disease. And we all know the widely published disparities about the COVID pandemic. And so the aim for me is to change how we do research around this and increase health literacy. So that way we can start to address these disparities as well as increase or change the way we deliver care. And so one of the ways that it started doing that was just by writing this to try to shine a light on the issue. So this was an article that I wrote that was published in JAMA and I combine my thoughts around achieving equity, but I also put in some of my own personal experience to, dis, to, excuse me, to demonstrate why change was needed and why we need to change the narrative. And so this is just a brief excerpt of something um, that I included in that article. But as I told you, when I was in medical school, the way we talked about racial disparities was just Do you think that access to care and the fact that Black people have been marginalized for so long might be leading to these disparities? And he just looked at me and very confidently said, no, it's the tumor biology. It's the genetics of Black men. And so I, I thought to myself, with the way that we describe race in this country, the way we define race in this country, it's no way. So I saw it on a mission to change the narrative. And so whether we talk about participating in events like this um, panel that was put on by the Prostate Cancer Foundation, where we actually looked at the disparities we saw with the brand new disease in COVID-19 and how that applied to prostate cancer disparities, we were trying to shift the narrative. Or things like this commentary, which again, drew a connection between the disparities that we saw within COVID-19 to other public health crises all in the effort to show that these disparities are a result of societal problems, not some type of innate biology based off the color of your skin. Additionally, within medicine and research, we've been notoriously bad at how we discuss race and racism and its current day impacts. And so in this study, one of the things we did was we looked at prostate cancer, which perhaps has the most pronounced racial disparities when we talk about outcomes out of any cancer. And we looked at all of those studies performing a comparative analysis dating back to 1960. And what we wanted to see was what these publications are the numbers of publications increasing year after year. The year after year, the number of publications has increased. 
But when we look at the actual number of publications that mention race as a social construct, which you see in this graph up top, or mentioning racism, what you notice is it's minimal at best. And so doing this type of, these type of publications help change the narrative. In addition to that, hosting podcasts like this one that was put on by the American Society of Clinical Oncology, where we talked about social determinants of health and structural racism and the impact it has on the racial disparities that exist now within healthcare. And this is Dr. Robert Wynn, who's the Cancer Center Director at VCU where I trained. And this is um, Mrs. Sylvie Leotin, who is um, a technology innovator and a, process, excuse me, and a cancer survivor. And she uses her background to kind of merge and provide innovative ways that providers can start to learn how to interact with patients to reduce bias. And then finally, when we look at changing the narrative and research around it, this was an article or a publication that was recently um, put out. And what we did was we combined all the patient level data for these prostate cancer comparative analysis studies. And what we found is that those studies that did a good job of incorporating data around social determinants of health into their analysis, the disparities we saw within prostate cancer steadily dissipated. In fact, Black men actually had better survival, but those studies that did not do a good job of collecting comprehensive data about their patients, what we found is that the disparity was starkly pronounced. And so I'll kind of wrap up here. And so hopefully, you know, you can see how within these three categories, the work we're doing is striving towards equity. And so I want to leave with some uh, key takeaways in my opinion. The first is um, we must recognize that healthcare disparities are part of a larger societal problem. As we strive towards equity, we have to accept that race is a social construct and recognize the current day implications of racism. And then as researchers, and I'm sure there's some on this call, we have to be more responsible. We have to collect and analyze the impact of social determinants of health on our patient outcomes. Anything less than that is irresponsible. And I wanna leave you with two quick final thoughts. One, actually I heard recently, I was at dinner with a good brother by the name of Percival Kane. And he said something that was so dope to me and I, I love this. He said, none of us can do everything, but every one of us can do something. So I couple that with this last thought, which comes from perhaps the biggest warrior for social justice in the history of mankind. And which he said, be the change you wish to see in the world. And so I implore everyone that is listening to me now who might listen to this later to enact that change in the way that you live your life and to do something to help push us towards equity. And I'll stop there and take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Vint. So the first question, how did the healthcare ecosystem in Cleveland get so lucky to have you here? <laughs> um, well, that's very flattering, but you know, it, there were a few things actually. So um, when coming out of fellowship, um, I, you know, we had different offers from places that were trying to recruit me. Um, and I talked to Lee Ponsky, who's the chair of urology. And, you know, he was just such an out of the box thinker. And, you know, he, he, he said, look, you know, this is something that needs to be addressed. I think your passions accurately align with everything that we want to do. Um, would you be interested? So then I came to Cleveland and I, you know, I, I admit I had only been to Cleveland one time prior to that. And I noticed that if you're not from the Midwest, Cleveland really doesn't. And then I drove around Cleveland and I saw a lot of the same struggles that I saw when I was growing up. And I knew that this was somewhere that I could come and serve. And so from that moment on, me and Lee continued to have this dialogue. And I said, yeah, I'm all in. I'm ready to come and I'm ready to serve. Excellent. So in July 2020, you published a profile piece in the Journal of the American Medical Association titled Eradicating Racial Injustice in Medicine, If Not Now, When? 
Mm-hmm. Can you tell us about that piece and your vision for what racial justice would look like in medicine? Yeah, um, so I'm gonna try to keep, I don't know how much time, we got 30 minutes. Okay, so I can give the, the more detailed answer. I was gonna give the short answer, but um, you know, that piece actually came out of a conversation that I was having um, with the then chairman of the department at University of Michigan. Um, well, he's still there, but I was at University of Michigan at the time. And he's a, um, not only was he the chairman, but he was a, a mentor of mine. Um, and after George Floyd happened, you know, I, I think I was just expressing my frustration with the whole situation. And I think the one thing that I really honed in on that conversation was the fact that this was nothing new. So there were so many people that were crying and expressing that frustrations and rightfully so. But me being a black man from Baltimore, we had these, these cops called, we call them jump out boys that will randomly just pull you over, draw guns on you and search you for no reason. So for me, having that personal experience, having had just walking down the street, have people stop you, pull their guns on you, get you on the ground, search you, and then stand you up and say, here you go, have a nice day. It's not hard for me to see how these events keep occurring time after time after time after time. In fact, I even saw cops shake down my own father when I was younger. And so George Floyd wasn't anything that surprised me because it had been happening over and over and over again. And so I started to express this frustration and how as a society, I felt like we were just now advancing and when we talk about the stages of adult learning, starting with um, unconscious incompetence. And I felt like we were shifting as a society to now having a conscious incompetence where everyone knows there's a problem, but nobody's doing anything about it. And so, you know, after that conversation, he looked at me and he's like, you just taught me so much in this conversation. You should write this because more people need to hear it. And so, I, I did. I just put in some of my experiences and I wrote all of the things that I thought needed to happen for us to strive towards equity and reverse a lot of the impacts of racism within medicine, but not just medicine, be more so within a society. And we have a question from Maddie McCarthy at University Hospitals. Yeah, so going back to when you were talking about how you received like racist memes from your fellow students and stuff and how your professors kind of blew you off and stuff like that. I want to talk about uh, ask you if you have any like um, scripts or stuff, uh, how to address um, racist comments and stuff like that. I mean, I have my own, but if you have any helpful scripts that you can give people or if people on this call have any scripts, it's always nice to add to the repertoire, so to speak. Every department should, it, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, all right. I, I, I don't know if I cut out just then. I'm sorry about that if I did. But um, what I was saying is that I personally don't have any scripts, but I do think that it is something that um, every department should um, do education and training about. Um, because, you know, the, the experience I had within medical school, I mean, to be honest, was just unacceptable. The kid that sent me that meme, he, openly said, yes, I, I sent it. Um, it was a joke, but it, you know, it used some very racist language. Um, and to me, like anybody who does anything like that in medical school of all places should be kicked out. But again, that didn't happen. And then we have another question from the chat. What is your advice for those young black students trying to pursue a medical degree? Uh, yeah, so a number of things. Um, Seek out mentorship from someone who is further along than you are that you can connect with. Um, that does not mean, I mean, granted, like, you know, if you're a black man, if you can find a black male mentor, that's great. But if you can't, that's okay. Find someone who you can connect with because I often tell a lot of the kids that I go and talk to, you know, if you're thinking about a journey or a path that is dark and unknown, it seems like a very daunting task to trap a daunting task and a difficult journey to, to forge. But when you have people in your corner who can kind of highlight the things that you need to do, they can give you advice, they can share personal experiences with you. Now that daunting task starts to 
become a little more doable. And so that would be the first thing. The second thing is to always take whatever negative experiences you have, whatever negative experiences someone is, you know, or, or it's negative, a statement someone has made that discourages you, internalize it, process it, use it for motivation. Um, because, you know, the only person who can control your destiny and where you ultimately end up is yourself. So, I, you know, there's other things, but I would just start with those two things. All right, let's talk a little bit about your work and translation. So the process of translation involving training observations in the lab, clinic and community into interventions that improve the health of individuals and the public mm -hmm. from diagnostics and therapeutics to medical procedures and behavioral changes. Can mm -hmm. you share a bit about the research you've done or plan to do and how you ensure that it won't get lost in translation, pun intended? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I think for so long, the Analyzing how our history has led us to this point. And so when it comes to my research, the goal is to really look at how social determinants of health and structural racism impact health outcomes. And then beyond that, you know, I, I think if you live in a marginalized community, the exposures you have actually influences your health. And so it, it's well known now that where you live and where you grow up has more of an impact on your health outcomes than the color of your skin. And so by doing research that highlights this issue, um, we again, bring light to the issues and we highlight those issues. But the, the next part is really around outreach and engagement. And so the goal is to continue to do programming that is aimed at empowering marginalized communities and bringing more people into the health system so that way they can control their own health. Regarding uh, getting lost in translation, like you said, um, <laughs> you know, I don't know. I, I, to be honest with you, I'm not scared of the challenge. These important issues. And even if, like I said in the presentation, even if it makes other people uncomfortable, I'm still going to do it because I know that this is the right thing to do. So I guess as long as I have breath in my body and good mental health, um, I'll continue to push and that'll be the way that this will not be lost in translation. Excellent. Thank you. Melinda, would you like to come off mute and ask your question? Yeah. So you've discussed how uh, racial co concordance increases trust with the healthcare system. Um, unfortunately, as a Caucasian, I don't have that racial accordance. So aside from learning, educating, and be aware of the problem, is there anything I can do to increase that trust in the healthcare system? Um, now, are you speaking as a patient or a provider? Um, I, I'm a, a part of the diagnostic team. Okay. disparities and tackling their own implicit biases. Um, the first thing, which sounds so simple, but it's actually not very often, in, you know, um, put into practice is to just treat every patient like they're your own family member, right? Like, you know, none of us, no matter what race you are, is better than the other person. We all want really at, heart, at our heart of hearts, we all want the same things. We all want to take care of our families. We all want to love and be loved. We all want to live long, healthy lives. So when you take a step back, no matter what a patient looks like, put yourself in their shoes, right? See where they're coming from and then treat them like your family. Now, I say that fully knowing I'm the oldest of four. So it's sometimes that my brothers and sister drive me crazy, right? Like, so I'm not saying that a patient won't do that. They won't touch their nerves. But at the end of the day, I'm still always going to do what's best for them. And so I implore other providers 
um, to do exactly that. And then the other thing is always participating in um, shared decision making. So one of the things that I know we do a bad job of as providers is actually shared decision making. I feel like we do a lot of talking at patients and not really taking in what is most important to them. So you should always be seeking the participation of your patients, right? Always think about culturally, religiously, what things are most important to them and hearing them out when they talk about their desires, when it comes to screening, being diagnosed or treatment, whatever it may be because that's the real way you start to build that connection. I can't tell you how many times I've seen a, a patient and no. Amazing, just for listening. So I think those are easy ways that we could start to rebuild that um, distrust that exists and start to build, rebuild those um, provider patient connections. Thank you. And Sherelle asks, how can you be requested to speak? Is there a particular way to reach out to <laughs> with a group of kids and nonprofits? And this will be a great asset for them. Yeah, um, always happy to, um, I, I guess, let's see. I'll, I can, I'll post my email in the chat and feel free to reach out. Um, but yeah, always happy to speak um, and always happy to engage with the community. Thank you. Let's talk about some health disparities in urology or urologic cancer that you've seen. How does that intersect with your leadership priorities over minority men's health? Yeah, so, um, you know, that's a great question. One of the things that I want to be very cognizant of is, you know, I, and I said this a little bit in the presentation, you know, I, the article I referenced was about survival within colon cancer, but those disparities exist within all types of cancer, specifically within urologic cancer. And so I just want to kind of highlight two things, two cancers really quickly that we treat as urologists. And I told you about the story of my grandmother with um, kidney cancer. Well, most kidney cancers are diagnosed really by accident. You go in, you might have a cough, they do a scan, and that chest x-ray or excuse me, that chest CT scan might catch the top part of your kidney and they see that you have a mass there. And so most of these um, tumors are able to be excised where we just excise the tumor plus a little piece of the healthy kidney um, to make sure we got everything. Furthermore, we're able to do these procedures, what we call minimally invasively. So that means no real big incisions or anything like that. So even within this specific niche, if you will, if you're black and poor, <laughs> rather than having that mass cut out, that tumor cut out and leaving the remainder of the kidney there, you're more likely to have your whole kidney removed, which ultimately impacts your kidney function down the line. And you're more likely to have one of these big old school incisions that is harder to recover from. So, you know, that's just a disparity that we see right there within kidney cancer when it comes to treatment. But then when we talk about the most prevalent cancer like prostate cancer, black men are more likely to not undergo screening. However, more likely to be diagnosed and die from prostate cancer. And so, <clears throat> This is seen even though when we look at the numbers for prostate cancer, um, if the cancer is caught early and is confined to the prostate, your chances of dying from prostate cancer within the next five years is essentially zero. And so these are just some quick examples of some disparities that exist within urologic cancers that we're trying to focus on. So when we do our programming, it's really aimed at, again, health literacy. So that way, anyone who's in attendance, any participant knows, okay, when I'm this age, I should be getting screened for these things, right? When I get an abnormal test, this is what my physician should be discussing with me. These are the screenings that I should undergo, right? And so when you have this knowledge, when someone offers you substandard care, you can start to say, hold on one second. <laughs> I know for a fact 
I'm supposed to be getting screened for this, right? I am 52 years old. Why are you not checking me for prostate cancer? Why are you not recommending that I have a colonoscopy? Because we know that if we screen, get more men screened, and we intervene at an earlier stage, that the outcomes will be much improved. And so these are just some examples of things that we're aim to, aiming to address with the minority men's health program that we're establishing. Excellent. So I feel like you've given us quite a few takeaways and marching orders, if you will. I referenced that with Joel, but if you could maybe sum it up with two or three things that you want the audience to take away and maybe do today or in the short term to really advance health equity and our respective roles, considering that we have healthcare providers on the line, caregivers, the research community, what, what should we be doing next? I am so sorry. My internet froze just as you were starting to ask that question. So could you, <laughs> could you repeat it one more time? <laughs> so marching orders or two or three key takeaways. I know that you referenced, the, referenced some in your presentation, but what mm -hmm. should we know? We have caregivers, physicians, researchers on the line. What can we do in the short term to really advance health equity? Yeah, um, wow, that's a great question. I have so many thoughts around this, but I try to keep it brief. Um, you know, first and foremost, we we have touched on some of these things, but I want to implore everyone to just do what you know is right. You know, so Did I freeze again? I'm so sorry. You, you can hear me now? Now we can hear you. If you could start. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I am so sorry. Um, this is what happened when you try to do stuff from home, right? <laughs> um, so to answer your question, I, I, I think just starting off by doing what you know is right. We're all here. We all, we're talking about equity because we know this is the right thing to do. So start off there. Like we said, just do something, right? You know, all of us have unique skill sets, right? So it doesn't mean that you have to be a surgeon. You don't, you know, if you're in the healthcare field, whatever your skill set is, apply that so that way we can push towards equity. And then as researchers and within the healthcare field, um, within medical research, don't be afraid to push back on um, the old narratives that we've been taught. You know, because it's obvious that we've been doing the same thing over and over and over again, and we're still in the same place. And just to kind of give an example about that, we've poured billions of dollars in research towards identifying a genetic cause for the difference and why Black men are more likely to die from prostate cancer than white men. And with those billions of dollars, you thought you would think we were able to identify a specific genetic cause, but we haven't. So, you know, and the data that we found is all over the place, right? So, you know, that is one of the reasons why I say, don't be afraid to challenge narratives. Don't be afraid to push back because we need to, as a collective field within healthcare, no matter what your role is within healthcare, do a, a, a massive pivot in the way that we do things and the way that we analyze the racial disparities that we know exist. Perfect. All right, so what is next? We will have Michelle Browder. She's the owner of More Than Tours. She's an advocate, artist, and visionary of the Mothers of Gynecology Monument. And that'll be next Thursday, February 16th from noon to one. The best part is that since you're here, you already registered for the series. So we hope to see you there. And we thank you so much, Dr. Vince. All right, thank you. It was a pleasure being here. It was wonderful. And if you want to share with the audience where you'll be tonight and what you'll be doing uh, with the color of care. Yeah. Um, so we will be at Ahuja. We're doing a viewing of the color of care and then we'll have a panel um, afterwards discussing steps towards health equity. So feel free to drop by. Um, and then again, this will be at Ahuja. I'm, the conference room we'll be in um, is slipping my mind right now, but um, feel free to come to Ahuja in the front desk and just let them know you're there for the viewing. All right, thank you very much. So what can you do today? In addition to all of the things that Dr. Vince recommended, you can schedule a ready consultation at spark.case.edu. You can sign up to attend future programming and join our listserv, or 
Visit our website and review CTSC DEIA resources. Our website address is case.edu backslash medicine backslash CTSC. You can follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn. Let's connect. Send us an email. We are here to help you and all in that joining, you know, we're here for the cause, advancing health equity. So thank you so much again, Dr. Vince, and for everyone on the call for your time, questions, and attention. And we hope to see you next week. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Take care.